possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTGA podcast. Mikey Stafford with you and Rory O'Neill. And we've been joined by Jackie Tyrrell to look back on the weekend's GAA uh, hurling specifically. Jackie, how are you getting on? I'm good. How are you, Mikey? I'm good. We were in Nolan Park yesterday to savour a. Uh, we won't call it a Titanic tussle. It was, uh, did you stay awake for it, Jackie? The less said about this game, the better, not Mikey. It was, oh, it was horrendous stuff. I mean, lacked intensity, atmosphere. And, oh, there was just there was just nothing really to it at half time it was 17-8 Kilkenny and Kilkenny were actually playing really poorish at that stage and at one stage in the first half a ball went into the corner own Cody gathered it up and Paddy Mullen who was midfield for Kilkenny kind of drifted into the centre forward position and own Cody hit it back to him Paddy Mullen slipped the ball came across hit him in the chest he timed to get up off the ground raise the ball and hit it at his ease over the bar it just there was no, the only time there was any bit of physicality confrontation was then the ball went into the Kenny full forward line and the Dublin full back line were at it, to be fair. Other than that, yeah. Derek Ling, he'll just move on quickly from it. Michal O'Donnell, they'll just bank it and say, look, it was just one of those days. I, I took some solace from the fact that, who I think is an outstanding hurler, Owen O'Donnell, was fumbling balls, falling off. I I believe that Dublin trained really hard last week. Look at how lethargic they were. There was just too many good players that just weren't mm. at it yesterday. Um, for me to take any kind of at now of at all, I'd say to put in a heavy block because they were so far off off the races yesterday. It would be very worrying for for me, Hollow Dunham. Yeah. Um a few poor games over the weekend, Roy, but you know, such complaints pale in comparison when the news coming out of uh out of Offaly uh, last yeah. night or out of Limerick Liam Kearns uh, passing away at uh, the age of his early 61 I believe yeah. um, shocking shocking supposedly took three hours, took took training for three hours yesterday morning was as well as he'd ever been and uh, then just um, died suddenly it's, it's just sad and scary at the same time yeah and it puts everything into context uh, it's absolutely desperate for him for his family his wife and his children it's just tragic um, life is fragile and that's just uh, just a big lesson for all of us and uh, I, I met Liam once uh, did a post-match interview when he was over Tipperary covering a, a league game um, an absolute gentleman to deal with on that occasion I've heard loads of glowing tributes about him since and all very well justified I was on the phone to Kieran Whelan last night because he's in absolute shock over it. He was quite very friendly with Liam because they would have got to know each other quite well in this through the Celebrity Banished Door series when both of them were in charge of teams and helping out and mentoring teams and just 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 pure and utter shock and devastation. And all you can say is you just send your best best wishes and best thoughts to um, everybody in Offaly, everybody in Kerry. Or I think Liam was living in Limerick uh, mm-hmm. and all his family. And uh, it's it's awful. But there you Yeah. Yeah. Um, he was his former, former county chairman, Michael Dignan, was on Morning Ireland with Darren Frell this morning. So just play that for you now because it was a really lovely tribute um, to a man who seemed to have uh, really... Uh, gathered the affection of football people wherever you worked, whether it was Kerry, Limerick, Tipperary or Offaly. Michael, condolences to you and everyone in Offaly GA this morning. How is everyone doing? Um, <clears throat> look, Darren, we're, we're, we're in deep shock, I suppose. Um, but I suppose before I say anything else, could we just pass on um, our condolences um, to Angela, his wife Angela, and his daughters Laura and Rachel and his family and close friends. Um, you know, whatever we're feeling is nothing compared to what they're feeling this morning. So um, we're, we're we're devastated here, and and they're devastated. We spoke. To, I spoke to Laura a couple of times last night, and they just can't believe it. Um, he was up training with us yesterday in great form. Um, he was never looking as well. He lost a couple of stone in weight. He was training himself, and he was dieting and looking after himself so well. And it's just just hard to believe, Darren. Hugely popular figure, as I said. I think anyone that crossed his path would have told you he was an absolute gentleman, but a perfectionist and, and an ambitious man as well. What attracted you to him that wanted to bring him into the Offaly job? Um, 
look, I I'd known of him, and like you said, admired him from a distance. Did a great job he'd done. Um, with, you know, he was with Leash and Limerick and Tipperary, but he'd done a massive job with limited resources, maybe at times playing resources, maybe, and um, you know, had some great success. And just from the first time I met him, he drove up to the Fairfield Fields to meet me maybe last July. And the minute I met him, I knew he was the right man for the job. Um, straight talker. He knew his football. He was very organised. Um, as you say, ambitious. He had retired from the guards as sergeant of the Gardaí. And, you know, he said something to me. He said, I want to get this right. He said, because this is going to be my last job. And, you know, we didn't think it was going to end like this. So, um, you know, he just he, he just had a great ambition for off. Great love the way he settled in and um, I'm really upset for our players. He, he had developed a great relationship with, with he, he had assembled a top backroom team, but he had developed a great relationship with our players. I spoke to Declan Hogan, our captain last night, Anton Sullivan, and the lads are, you know, j- just the respect that we all had for him. And we, we were down nine or ten players this year um, for different reasons injuries, lads travelling, a couple of retirements, key players, and he just got on with it and he had huge plans for Offaly. And, um, you know, one, one of the lads texted me last night, Rory McNamee, and he just said he had the dressing room in the chokehold since he took over. And I think that just speaks, you know, that says it all, really. Michael Dignan, thanks for joining us on the programme this morning. OK, that was Michael Dignan paying tribute to the late Liam Kearns. Uh, may he rest in peace. Um, OK, moving on to the hurling. Um, I think it, worth mentioning, Jackie, um, Eamon Dillon has retired through injury. Um, something's finally slowed him down because I think from your experience, um, there wasn't much that slowed Trollier down. No, he was a live wire and he was a very direct, dynamic corner forward, caused a lot of cocks, a lot of hardship. And you would, you would, you know, for he's obviously coming to the end of his intercounty career. And I know he has a, a couple of kids and things like that. So obviously, life has changed priorities. But what Dublin could actually do with him, uh, even yesterday and, and, and going forward this year. But, you know, he was a real, he was a real thorn in the side for us for years. And then probably he kind of two stages of his career, then he kind of wasn't getting his game, but was still contributing off the bench and was obviously would always give Dublin a bit of an injection and a bit of a goal thread every time he came in. He was a great man to get a goal. So, you know, he'll be he'll be missed by Dublin and uh, he was a he was a fair corner forward. He really was, and he was um anytime he gets mentioned really, Rory, in the same breath, um Dalo gets mentioned because Dalo was such a fan of Trolley and he mm. would never shut up about him. Uh, but he was he was a cornerstone of that, you know, history making team, wasn't he? Excellent player and um, one of the few Dublin forwards, I suppose, over that time who was very direct. You know, he wasn't one of these kind of go around the houses. It was when he picked up possession, he nearly went straight through you and, you know, plays with the bogeys as they're known in Dublin, Finbars. Excellent footballer too, by the way. A massive club man. I mean, he was one of these players that would always tug out for his club. And I would assume that that's what he's going to do now, given the fact that his intercounty career has come to an end. But I think Jackie spot on. They could have done with him yesterday. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's more than one SOS going out. I, I, I'd say wherever Chris Crummy is and wherever Liam Rush is, I think the, the, bat, the bat signals need to be going up from Parnell Park to get all of these guys back because they just weren't at the races at all. Now, again, probably you know, a, a caveat attached with, you would hope, a heavy block of training is going on, which might have led to the lethargy we saw in their play yesterday. And they have a bit of time. I think the one good thing from a Dublin perspective is the run of fixtures. They kind of have the Kilkenny run from last year where they have maybe the two weaker teams, which will hopefully give them an opportunity to hit their straps before they face into the more stiffer tests in Leinster. Well, he has time, Michal, but he's, a, as Don Logue mentioned last night, he's a job of work ahead of him. Yeah, Jackie, we, we, it seems almost like Groundhog Day is a terrible thing for me to say about our podcast, but we, we, we do find ourselves trying to balance up like Wexford against Clare a couple of weeks ago. How bad were they? Like, is this a fundamental core issue with this team? Or can we chalk a lot of it down to the fact that there was, you know, there was a lot of training done they're experimenting with different systems, different personnel. Um, at some point before the end of the league, do you have to take stock of a team and say this is what they are, or can a team can a team basically experiment through the league, make sure they don't get into a relegation playoff, and then just hit reset at the start of the championship? Because as a Wexford fan, I'm saying yeah, that's definitely possible, but <laughs> I, <laughs> but maybe I'm being fanciful. Yeah, no, there has to be some level of continuity between the league and the championship. And the league offers plenty of opportunities to test, to develop your panel. And there's definitely games within that 
where teams target going, we're going to get a stiff test, we're going away from home, you know, we're backs up to the wall. And then there's just going to be games like that. And I feel yesterday, Dublin kick anyone worse. Neither team really went at it, probably did a lot of tough training, experimented like, a bit. I think Galway Clare falls under that category as well, yes. Yeah, I, I think it is. And I think the further on in the league that you go, the more likely these games are going to happen because you're coming closer to closer to the championship and teams are getting a bit nervous and probably training a little harder and kind of pulling back a small bit as regards the importance of, of the league. I do think that. And like if you look at Dublin, they had a really good performance in their first one uh, against Watford. Um, and I think they they I think yesterday wasn't a true reflection of where they are. Like as I lose that, when you've top class players like Owen O'Donnell missing rises, you know got a ball run straight out to the heart of the fences, hand passes straight to the Kenny lads. That's not him. That's not his game. We know that. He's a tried and tested player. You know, Danny Suckler, very heavy legged Jesse. I've no doubt that 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 they definitely went through a heavy block. But I do feel the the closer we get to the knockout of this league, more and more teams will be pulling back. Like you think you think back to even when Galway played Limerick in the previous round. You had a, 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 a situation on the sideline where Henry Sheffield and John Kiley are cracking a joke and, and John Keenan is in the middle and they're just having a laugh. Like, you know, <laughs> you go back to when they played the year before down in uh, Limerick, Henry was up and down the sideline, fist pumping and giving it all that. And so was John Kiley. So I just think that kind of shows two teams in different situations. The one thing, Jackie, could I ask you, you know, and Mikey, is there a weird quirk of fate in this league in that, given the four teams that are going to end up in the semi-finals, as things stand now, I mean, obviously there's one round to go and things could change, but looking at the way it's panning out with Cork, Tip, Kilkenny and Limerick. Now, if the four of them cross paths against each, which, you know, it's a very high probability at this stage, can you take a, st- can you sort of uh, take a step back? I mean, are you, you going to be able to pull the handbrake up in those types of contests, given how soon after you might end up facing one of these teams in a championship match? Like, I mean, how much is it going to pay if you go out and get a good hiding off somebody in a league game that you're maybe saying, look, we're going to, we're going, we're going, we're going to pull the handbrake up a wee bit here and then turn it around a couple of weeks later and try and take the same team out. I think, could the league semi-finals and finals actually deliver us a more competitive finish than maybe we originally envisaged? Yeah, I, I'd probably have two trails of thoughts on it. I said, one, if, if I'm in a league semi-final, and look, it probably applies more to the Munster teams, uh, Rory, because <clears throat> Kilkenny aren't going to meet any of the other three teams. Yeah, that's that true. Yeah. But if, 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 if we say a Cork took a beating off Limerick, you could also be handing huge motivation to Cork on. They're after getting stuffed by Limerick in the league semi-final, probably meeting them in a, in a couple of months later or a couple of weeks later on. They're, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, like how hard do you go? Look, managers can be cute about it too and train them hard enough so that they're just, they go hard, but they're just, their bodies aren't able to take them to places that they normally will. So, it is, it, is a, it is a very... I know Kenny will go hard at because they're lucky that they won't be meeting any of them for a while. And I think Derek Ling needs to kind of test a few more of these guys because he wouldn't have learned much yesterday from them. Yeah. And also, from, my, from where I'm standing, Jackie, I would imagine John Kiley and Limerick don't need to prove anything to anybody. So even if they lose to a Munster competitor, like after last year's league, would, you know... Tipperary or Kilkenny if they beat Limerick in the league semi-final they won't be dining out on that they won't be saying well that's no. yeah. that, that that's that's Limerick sorted we have their number now come yeah. the summer yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It, it, but it'll probably be the internal competition within Limerick because they have such competition for places that could really drive a strong performance from them when you have the likes of the lads that have come back Aaron Galan and that they'll really be chomping at the bit you've obviously other guys there that are pushing for a place so although John Kiley couldn't be driving it could be that internal high standard, high expectation. I want a jersey that could really push this Limerick team on. And, and that's kind of the beauty of this animal that they have. Did you yeah. see his, did you, by the way, speaking of Galan, did you see his double last? Did you see the, the point, the score he got, point where, the game, where, yeah. where, he, where he doubled on it? It was a vo- the volley point. For, like uh, he didn't even catch, just pulled on it. First time ball hops and uh, whatever he was doing anyway in the last few months, it definitely involved having a hurley in his hand. That's for sure, because he didn't look anyway. He didn't look one well, bit rusty. He was also playing soccer, so the va- the volley just came <laughs> yeah, naturally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he soccered it over the bar. Um, oh, it was incredible. 
Look, we'll, we'll, we'll leave Kilkenny and Dublin there because I don't think Jackie wants to revisit it. Um, but as I was saying before we came on air, Jackie, the um, the race to be the third best team in Leinster is really cooling down at the moment with uh, the Dublin, you know, non-show against Kilkenny. And then Wexford, a fired up and fairly strong Wexford's inability to beat the Kilkenny under-20s doesn't really augur very well. But I think for Wexford, Jackie, if they can get Liam Ryan back and figure out how to defend balls onto the edge of the square, they go a long way to winning matches. Because they they like, we were blaming Mark Fanning for them going out of the championship last year with the ball dropped against Clare. There's a new keeper and the same issues are occurring where Wexford just aren't dealing with balls to the edge of the square, which is maybe something, maybe modern hurling defences don't think they're going to have to deal with it, but it's um it's an issue for Wexford. Yeah, and, and Liam Ryan is really an old school full back, big, abrasive, very strong in the air, carries the ball out, kind of a bit of a brain loan about him. So I suppose he, his durability, the fact that he plays so much for Wexford, when he is gone, these are exposed and you kind of go, God, I didn't think we have an issue there, but it's an easy fix. You put Liam Ryan back in there and he just shores up that whole offence. But Matthew Hanlon went off injured yesterday and like mm. he is pivotal enough for Wexford too as well. You know, probably wouldn't be the flashiest of defenders, but does the nuts and bolts and the simple things of defending really, really well. And he's so, a big man, which is also an important Big man. Thing. And like when Polly Foley is gone, like the wrecks are small. Simon Dunhu is small. Colin Flood isn't exactly huge. Connor Devitt is small. So, so Liam Ryan and Matthew Hanlon, probably to a lesser extent, are hugely, hugely important to this defence from a physicality point of view, from a, 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 an aerial point of view, and even their presence of there. When they're there, they just seem to be an awful lot more settled at the back. Um, and you know, when, as I say, when they're when they're not there, it, it really does show how much they're missed. Mm. Wexford were fired up for this one, Rory. You, 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 I think you were watching that. You weren't like me. I was watching the rugby. I, I admit, um, you were watching this one in full, and you said Wexford were fired up and kind of paid a price for that. Really, Conor McDonald, Kevin Foley, um, going off da- injured. Damien, Damien Reck. Damien yeah. Reck. So you lost Connor McDonald, I think, after 13 minutes. He had a heavily strapped Sorry, calf. Came on, Foley came on for Reck, so yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. Had a, he had a heavily strapped calf and he was limping with that same calf as he was coming off. So I don't know whether or not there was a case that maybe he was rushed back before he was ready. Then you lost Damien Reck after, I think, a half an hour. Um, that looked maybe like a shoulder injury, which could be serious. And then, obviously, Matthew O'Hanlon, which looked like a knee. Now, there are three players. The injuries and in, and the, the amount of injuries that teams are starting to rack up. We There's a huge problem in Watford. I think Cork have their injury worries. I think every team, maybe really, except for Limerick. Limerick seem to be the only team that don't. Uh, you know, it seemed to be de- dealing from a fairly full deck, but you, it's it's becoming a big feature. And again, to go back to our old hobby horse, the condensed calendar, if you're gone for four to five weeks now, that could be the entire season. So it's going to be a tricky one from a Wexford perspective to try and manage that and try and get these lads back because they made such a big difference yesterday. The better team lost, I think, yesterday, from my view, Um I felt Wexford definitely restored a good bit of pride in their jersey. Um, they were right up for it from the get-go. Didn't really create a major goal-scoring chance. I thought possibly had one in that second half, Kieran. Someone's going to have to clarify the rule around the black card for me because I w- w- assumed what Kieran Joyce did should have merited one by you know, pulling a player down when he's clean through on goal, but I was outside the box. I don't know. I, I, I mean, don't think I, the refs are even carrying black cards. It's, 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 kind of, it's, kind of, it's kind of hard to figure out. There's so many different rulings in around the black card. You're kind of going, which one is this now? Is this the black card, the hurling or the football or this, you know? Um, I have to get Owen Ryan on again. Owen yeah, Ryan who works yeah, for RT yeah. online. Is, yeah. I, think, I think he has a PhD in the hurling black card. He can correct anybody yeah. on it. I'll get, I'll get a refresher course from yeah. him today I, for I, our next podcast. Yeah. I think, uh, so I think Dara Egan, I think, will be, even though they lost the game, I felt Cork kind of stole it really with a couple of hopeful balls into the box. But I think Dara Egan will have definitely got onto the bus to head home much happier than with, much happier than how how he would have felt after the, the well, game. Depending obviously. on how injured those uh, key yeah, players are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but I think they showed, they showed a good spirit and um, they probably should have won the game. Uh, Lee Chin was outstanding. Uh, Liam Og McGovern, I thought, was arguably their best player. And um, loads of really good positives for Wexford to build on. And 
probably the biggest challenge now as well is just to see if they can get some of the injuries to these key guys cleared up. Yeah, we say key guys, Jackie, and there's there's no doubt in the importance of Conor McDonald, Damien Reck, and Matthew Hannon, but the Wexford's reliance on Lee Chin for the last few years has been noticeable and it doesn't seem on the evidence of yesterday to be letting up at all. It's like, like Chin needs to be scoring 9, 10, 11 points or Wexford are in serious grief. Yeah, there's a huge reliance on him and, and Wexford probably have the thinnest panel when you look around we say the major teams that will be competing for honours they are thin on the ground and it was something that Darry Egan had commented last year against Clare that they just ran out of bodies and, and, and that's kind of ultimately what how they lost to Clare last year um, and it doesn't seem like they've unearthed a huge amount of talent I mean Charlie McGuckin is probably the leading light from as regards new guys that could break in so it is going to be a concern from for Darry's point of view and particularly when you have such uh, volume of guys that are injured and key players with Leach in so crucial to this team. I mean, it used to be kind of him and Connor McDonald, but he's definitely a man up there from from an aerial point of view, from winning ball, from and he just demands so much attention that if you're playing Wexford in the morning, you're probably putting your best defender on him. And when he's in the vicinity, there's probably he's double teamed in some scenarios. So he's just brought his game to a really, really elite level. Um, and he's just Darry need to wrap him in cotton hole and make sure that he has him for, for the lengths around Robin because Wexford without Lee Chin could be a little bit they could be toothless in their attack. Yeah. Richie Lawler was a, a like looked like he was, you know, a bright young thing. Obviously he got a bit of an injury and he could probably he's so young he probably could have used with a bit of league experience before the championship comes. So he's probably not he's probably not a starter. So Rory tell us this um this wasn't now Dar Egan can take some some pride from it, but this wasn't Cork's A team we were looking at at all. No, um, it was the B they, team. It was it was it was the B team. Like there's not like to Joyce and a few more sprinkled yeah. around. But did anybody stand out for you? The only thing I would say is they were still dependent on Harnedy coming Harnedy. off the bench and Alan Cadigan coming in, and some of the more tried and trusted to start to pull them over the line towards the back end. An awful lot of ball in that first half that fired into the full forward line didn't stick. Um, Declan Dalton didn't probably have his have 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 a have his best day. Um, Brian Hayes, who I mean, you know, might be controversial to say it. I felt probably should have joined the football panel as opposed to the hurling panel. I think he will struggle for game time um, with the hurlers once everybody is you know full and ready to pick from. I'm not so sure if he'll get get a start. He might get some minutes. He obviously started yesterday, scored one point, but didn't really impact the game in the way that I sub, I'd say a fella getting his chance at that level might like to. The one big plus from my point of view in terms of new guys coming in, and he's not necessarily a new fella. I really like Tommy O'Connell at wing back. Um, he's a smaller fella. Um, Middleton. I, I There's just, there's a bit of, there's a bit of what Cork need about him, you know? The one thing that Cork humility, eh? No. No, no, no. He probably doesn't have that either, Mikey. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's a good one. No, but there is there is something about Tommy, I think, and just he's got a bit of grit and he, he's just able to mix it in a way that maybe some of the defenders that, you know, he'll be competing with um, it, it has that element to his game. But I'd like, I mean, I was reading Derek McGrath recently and he made a not the not um, very astute point that by the time you get to championship, Cork could be going back to... And a lot of the same people that we'd probably have seen playing, certainly in the forwards, going all the ways back to the 2017 All Ireland hurling semi final, which will be the likes of your Harnadies, Patrick Horgan's, Connerly Hands, Alan Cadigan's, Shane Kingston's. And there won't be a huge amount of change from that in terms of what we saw yesterday. Rory, what's your view on Owen Downey? Yeah, I think he just needs to fill out a small bit more. Brilliant hurler, really sticky. Um, he's, 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 he's always touch tight. He's got that ability as well, which I think is very important in modern inter-county hurling to be able to get the ball up in tight spaces into your hand. That's such a massive part of the modern game. 
I just would fear in a man-to-man situation with him going up against a Seamus Flanagan. I'm not entirely sure physically would he be ready for that type of challenge just yet. Plenty of stake and pasta maybe over the next 12 months and we might have to review that. <laughs> you know, But he is just a little bit... He's just underdeveloped. He's very, very young. Like, Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll, we'll move on, lads. Um, just to talk about Claire and Galway just for a moment. Um, we'll get on to... Henry Shefflin's very honest comments afterwards, which is mm. back to what we said about the league. But first, just a moment to appreciate Tony Ke- Kelly's um, assist oh. for Cahill Malone's point. Uh, if you didn't see it, um, sideline on his own 45-yard line, he takes a look around and he pings it. And it never goes higher than, I'd say, 14 feet above the ground and um, bounces on the, on the 65 in the Galway half and lands in the lap of Cahill Malone who's made a run through the centre of the pitch and Cahill Malone puts it over the bar Rory, most people would disagree with me I would actually rank that as a skill above his monster final sideline point I know yeah. well, I know the stakes weren't as high but the actual just the the accuracy and everything involved in it I think was just off the charts like I, I rewound it because I was saying did he mean that? <laughs> it looked to me like you know I was kind of saying was it a fluke? No, I won't. He actually, it was completely intentional. It was extraordinary. It was absolutely extraordinary. It was the moment of the weekend for me, without any doubt. I mean, just the, the skill, that distance, that vision to execute it in winter hurling, which we kind of still are. Um, ah, it was sublime and very, very few players, I'd say, very, very few capable of doing it. Joe they Cannon. They wouldn't even think of it. Yeah, Joe, Joe Canning is the only other player that I'd know of that maybe that would have that skill in his locker. Yeah, Ronan Maher, perhaps another fine man with a sideline, but like I don't think he'd even try it. Jackie, were you one of these quarterbacks you used to always be practicing the sidelines of training? Just to, you know, <laughs> there's always a few who always say, I oh, know, nah, never mind, never mind, never mind. Uh, Chef went up there now, he's only cutting you now. I'm, I'm the real master at this. Uh, I, the practice I used to do was. Assembling the little tuft of grass. That's what yeah. I was like. That was the key for me. You know, I'd know before I hit it whether it's going to be a good or a bad one. And then it, it was, you know, the awkward moment you pull a sideline down and it rolls off, and then you pull it back up and it rolls off. And the crowd, hey, 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 hit it. And you're like, do I just pull on this and get it out here or like go oh, again? But uh, no, I, it was fairly basic. It was just get it out of there as far as you could. Um, but it, was, it would have been like, it would have been one of your responsibilities. That's the thing a cornerback does. If you get a sideline inside your own 21 or whatever, like it's probably the cornerback's gig just to get that back into play, is it? Oh, it is, yeah. And it's not an easy one. Like, no. like <laughs> you're still defending and, you know, you're backed up against your own goal. If you don't get a good one, you know, you're in trouble. But like the level of sidelines these is, is phenomenal. Like if a lad, if a lad scuttled one across the ground now, it'd really stand out. Like if you're not hitting it 40, 50 yards, it's kind of, it's, it's you know, it's only an average one really. But like, Ronan Marr, remember he put one over the bar a couple of years ago from the middle of the field. Yeah. He's exceptional, but he's just a real distance one. But for distance, the, yeah. For, for dainty, exquisite ones, Tony Kelly and Joe Canning. And I've seen TJ a few times. TJ Cody can do ban, it. Yeah. Cody used to ban TJ from taking sidelines. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He said, for every one that went over, seven or eight of them sailed wide and it's frustrating. Right. So he just banned TJ so TJ wasn't allowed to take them anymore. <laughs> uh, I, 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 just, I just love to watch. And like I said, as much as wonderful as that sideline was in the Munster final, in a way you kind of expect him to do it. Or it's why you knew what he was going to try and do. The joy of yesterday, Rory, was like he took a second to take it and then oh he had to look around it. he yeah. pinged it like yeah, it was just <laughs> yeah it into was... his stride it was the most yeah. remarkable thing i've seen in a it was time. it was glorious it, it really, really was. was um anyway they got the win i think jackie we were here chatting about this on thursday saying you know at some point kind of we we, we wanted to see a galway performance that made us go jesus yeah that's shefflin's galway now they're going to be a force this summer they beat claire in a local derby but they didn't they didn't have to shock or all anybody with it. So they, they're still a work in progress, I guess, as every county is. But um, maybe the pieces are coming together a little bit. Conor Whelan, I think, proved he's an inside forward with his goal. They'll give up on this experiment with him in a half forward line at some point. But, um, you know, do, do, you, do you kind of, we talked about it a few weeks ago, do you see Shefflin's team coming together here? 
I do. I, I really, really fancy Galway this year. I think they're going to have a real cut off it this year. I feel Henry has them in a good place. Um, I do think they're slowly adding a few bits of new guys to their team. I like what they're doing. Dahi Burke was back yesterday. He's obviously going to be pivotal. Scored two uh, points from full back. Yeah. That, that just shows you how loose the game when Dahi Burke comes up from full back. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, know? you know, you know how loose the game is really. But um, yeah, I, I, I just love Galway's physicality. I've been able to mix that with slick hurlers, the Mannions. I mean, we haven't seen a whole lot of caught. Like, I think he's really key to what they do around the middle third. Uh, Connor Wheeler back inside. Uh, I had a good conversation with Joe Canning about him. Like he just, Joe was just raving about how good he is inside to win that dirty mm. ball and just put the head down. And he's really got that goal threat with Brian Concanon. So I like a lot of. I, I I wouldn't put any real mass on yesterday. It'd be more that they stood toe to toe with Limerick last year. They just had nothing off the bench last year to really get him over the line. And I think Henry's working on that behind the scenes. And I think it'll just. I think he'll just add another couple of players. That would make this Galway team a really impressive outfit. Yeah, and mm. right, right, there's there's no reason to be, yeah. I, I think, saying any prayers for Claire by any means. They they kind of proved what they could do a couple of weeks ago. We don't need to dwell on it. Um, no. So I, I think you know we'd be talking about them at the start of the league. They have a panel now. If they keep everybody fit, and um, Aidan McCarthy is just turned it into one of the most you know scary forwards in the game as well. I think when you like a fully fit McCarthy there as well on top of everything else. They do seem like a decent outfit and nobody will be judging them on yesterday. And they still have a few guys to come back, Mark Rogers. And like, they've, 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 like just looking at, they brought on Mouncey, Ian Galvin, Aaron Shanahar, Shane you know, Shane Amore. Like they have, they have a, a serious bit of depth that like they're in good shape. I, I, I was disappointed in them yesterday. Um, it was a very muted I don't know whether people were watching the bloody rugby on their phones or what was going on. I, I felt that there, we should have seen a little bit more of a contest anyway. And given the fact that you don't have all that many matches at home, you know, Clare versus Galway and Ennis and Cusick Park, I just thought it would fire. It just didn't, for whatever reason, the game didn't fire as a contest. And they started really well. I mean, like they were eight, seven, seven, one up, eight, one up after 20 minutes and they were motoring. But for whatever reason, just... Uh, the engine just stalled in some way. I don't. We, we like it. It was it was an odd game, um, but I think he's built a really good panel, and they've got a good bit of depth now. They're right in the mix there, and I don't think Claire would be all that worried about what happened. No, no, not at all. Um, uh, finally, then just to mention on the the one game on Saturday night, which was a bit of, bit of a belt brilliant match, Jackie. brilliant game. Uh, we that were was. saying the league can be a bit watery. Um, it certainly was on Saturday night. Tipperary and Watford. Uh, they went at it, um, and we can get on to maybe that physicality in a bit. I just saw it yet last night on Twitter, GA Statsman, which is at GA underscore Statsman, uh, did the top scorers for Division 1 in the league. Well, interestingly, they also did the top scorers from play, and Jake Morris is sitting pretty. Five goals and five points so far from four league matches is is good going, um, and it does look like Liam Cahill has, he definitely puts a value in a green flag, which is as you know, neutrals is kind of what you want to see in a game of hurling. Is you want to see a team hell bent on scoring goals? Yeah, and he, like it, I thought it was very obvious the one where Dan McCormick broke through, could have easily tacked the point and just took the extra couple of steps and passed it into Jake Morrison. Like, is the is the resemblance between him and Larry Corbett uncanny from mm. being left hand on top, yellow helmet, the way they hit the ball? They're just finishers, and yeah. Two times Jake Morris actually went back the field and won. No interest in sco- and no interest in scoring points. Goals only. Like. Yeah. <laughs> and like I think he just needs to be positioned up top. Keep him up there. He's electric. He's pacey. Work him or dovetail him off of Jason Ford or hopefully Seamus Cannon who'll be back. This guy is a finisher. Like five goals already this year, and it is a trait of Liam Cal. We've seen him at Watford. They do like to run the ball down the throat of the defence, and if there's a sniff of a goal. He has no problem at all taking it on and he wants goals. I thought it was a real, a real good, real tough uh, physical game. There was a nice, nice little bit of a needle in it, you know, there was some off the ball stuff there. Stephen Bennett definitely was targeted. There was a few little kind of scuffles as well. Um, but I must pay homage because I, I, Caleb Lines, lads, is a fantastic hurler. And it just, for some reason, I think he kind of goes under the radar. He's kind of, 
not really spoken about. This guy is a phenomenal, phenomenal. Five athlete. points, five points oh, from wing back. Man. If he does, like he's always scoring, but he's a good defender, covers the ground, very athletic, very good to get a ball up in tight, tight situations. I thought he was outstanding uh, the weekend. But Tipperary lads, they are a good, good team. They're mm. solid out. They're some good players. They've built in a good panel. I like what Liam Cal has done about them. Like there was, there was, it was obvious for me four or five different times. I just hit pause on the telly where it was five Tipperary lads around three Waterford lads, six on four that kind of thing. Like he, I'm surprised how quickly he's molded his team into mm. what Liam Cal is about. But they've definitely responded to him. Yeah. One of the things, though, for me, Mikey, with Waterford, and I, th- there was a very, I thought there was a big contrast in approach in terms of style. Tipperary will play the short game, and they could look. Tipperary can play the game any way you want, generally, given you know the the skills bank that they will always have. But they were they they I think they're mixing it really effectively in terms of they'll go long when necessary. I think Waterford try and run everything, and it's always the short option. And I don't know if that's sustainable. I think you do have to have, you know, look at Sony Davies first year in there. I'm sure that might be something that may come in time. But, you know, having maybe a a target option to take a little bit of the pressure off you and just to lamp the odd one in, all the teams are at it now. We saw uh, Cork obviously got their two goals. I mean, Tipperary can be very direct. Kilkenny are very direct. We know with Aaron Gillan and Seamus Flanagan as a two-man full forward line, Limerick have absolutely no problem in lettering ball into the, in on top of them and running it as well at the same time. I just don't know, is there enough dynamism within Waterford currently that will allow them to build a platform to have a real cut off the championship, and he's they might be slightly one dimensional. Sorry, he's yeah, highly, yeah, he's probably yeah. crucial to that as he's yeah. the kind of he's the, the Aaron Galan version for them, he's the pivotal man in the attack. You just kind of look at the profile of their players, they're not big physical players. I think when he's out of it, you lose a bit of that directness that you're yeah. talking about. Mm. 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 Um, just, just to go back for a second, Jackie, because I'm curious on the Jake Morris and uh, kind of Tipperary's kind of clear tactic going for goals as a defender um it has to change your mindset a little bit like say you were playing against the Limerick or the Galway of say two three years ago teams that were reaching all Ireland finals by scoring 30 points in a game and never really trying to score goals if you're a cornerback that clearly alters your approach if you know you're marking a guy who is almost inclined not to go for a goal whereas if you're marking a Jake Morris or a Lar Corbett a guy who you know doesn't really have an interest in points. It really has to change the like how a defense as a unit and as an individual kind of behaves. Of course it is because their behavior is different to to the to the norm. I suppose even individually as a cornerback, like if you're marking a team and a, and particularly a forward that likes to take the point, you can nearly step up a little higher on him and push him, press him a little harder. But if you have a Jake Morris, you nearly take a step back because this guy will take you on and he's the likes to burn you, you know. So it does it alters your approach and I suppose. Of of a of a team that scores goals and that you know when they, that they score goals. I always found Galway were great to score goals against, us. and if it did, it almost it almost shook you going. They're after getting it as a, again, you know that kind of way. So it's almost like if a team is targeting goals and they score goals, I I think mentally it can just kind of knock you a bit. Going here they go again. These mm-hmm. lads are just they just they're just able to get goals from as you know. Um, but, and you would think that Tipperary aren't pacey, but they're, they're able to get runners in. Like, you know, I, that, I thought that was very obvious. Um, and there's a new type of tip player, like the Alan Tynans of this world. They're just pacey, athletic. Connor Stakelin running from midfield. Noel McGrath seems to have got another kick in his legs. Like, he was very athletic, I thought, the weekend as well. Bonner Marr just offers something completely different in there. So... I think yeah. they'll, ask, they'll ask a lot of different questions within that attack. And you've Jason Ford coming on then the last 20 minutes and just snaps over five or six points. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. So Roy, just, quick... just, just one final thing though, Mikey, and I do think it's it's noteworthy, we should mention. <clears throat> it was a 10-point cliffhanger. It, it became 10 points because oh. Waterford, again, had somebody sent off. Mm. You, you can't go down to 14 in modern inter-county hurling. 
you will be dead in the water within seconds because of the way teams can play around, you know, it is absolutely vital. I mean, they had sendings off last year in the Munster Championship as well, I think, didn't they? Against Cork in, the, in, the, in that pivotal game was Austin Gleeson red carded, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Like, you just can't. You can, Like, your discipline is absolutely essential. Mm-hmm. Now, we, we didn't see what happened with the Jamie Barron one. Davy didn't really seem to... Uh, crib too much about it uh, on the TV last night but yeah I mean just you you just can't get anyone sent off it's like I mean the game was on a knife edge and mm. within minutes of him being sent off it was busted so you, you just you just have to keep everybody on board yeah um, just funny as you mentioned then uh, Jackie uh, Kildare had a five point win over Kerry um, obviously very sad times down in Offaly at the moment um, but if the game goes ahead um, Offaly will be welcoming Kildare um, down to Tullamore on Sunday and it will be the winner goes straight into the Division 2A final and the, the loser will have to play a semi-final against Kerry or Carlo presumably um, that is a very big game Sunday obviously to get straight into the final helps uh, there's no shadow boxing in Division 2A this is almost their championship for a lot of these counties and we mentioned it here on Thursday um, for Kildare, for Offaly, obviously it would be huge as well, but for Kildare to make that leap up to the top tier, um, it would be something else. And like they're, they're doing everything they need to do at the moment. They seem to be, from watching the highlights last night, I won't pretend to be very familiar with a lot of Kildare hurlers, but they... They have some serious scorers, like, and they seem they do. They, you often you, you try and have a look at it and say, are they moving as quick as you know? Like, how would they? You know, obviously it's not at the same pace, but it's to the naked eye, it looks almost like you know they're playing a decent brand of hurling. It's not a million miles away from them. Their their consistency is off the charts. They're unbeaten so far this year. So, and going into this last game, it's kind of like a free cut for them too. Like their work to a certain point is done. They're in a league semi final beyond any probably expectations outside of Kildare. Um, so if they can have a real go, they'll get huge confidence from beating Kerry. Like Kerry were probably at the start of the year the favourite team to top that to top that division. They've beaten them, you know. So mm. it's they're just going from strength to strength to strength now. And it's great. It's great to see that off the back of obviously Nace doing some outstanding work on the club front the last couple of years there as well. So you know David Erity is doing a serious job there as well. And, and po- possibly the biggest game this weekend and we didn't really touch on it was was Antrim and Leash and a huge win for, for Antrim. And they've hit a really consistent level. Yeah, they're getting to kind of five, ten minutes to go and they're struggling to get over the big team, but they've been hugely consistent over the last while as well. So that was a big game and a big win for them the weekend. Yeah, certainly was. Um, okay, lads, uh, good chatting to you. We'll be back on Thursday to preview the double league weekend, football and hurling. And Ireland going for a Grand Slam as well. And it's Cheltenham week, so... Um, it's busy. Great, it's a great time for sports fans. <laughs> for sports journalists, it's not a great time to be sleeping, mm. but um, we won't complain. It is always... You ring, you ring, you kind of... You put a big circle around Paddy's week. It's always one where um, there's always plenty going on. So, look, we'll chat to you on Thursday. Thank you very much, Jackie. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Good luck. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it! He hits it! It's over the bar!